Welcome to Raising Happy and Thriving Gifted Kids, a daily podcast where you get relatable stories, interesting lessons and practical tips to help your kids thrive and be happy while enjoying your own life even more. Today we're going to talk about how a high-stake negotiations training helped me guide kids in being more successful in the classroom. So the story starts a little while ago and I got the chance to attend a training that was training me to learn nonverbal cues and nonverbal strategy analysis as a part of negotiation techniques. So there are these um, experts, um, Dr. Barry Goodfield is one of them, but it's actually a line of a lot of people who have studied people and studied their micro movements, especially in their face, like having their lips tighten or closing their eyes or opening their eyes or stuff like that. And they found a strong correlation with the emotions that are going on inside. And what this helps you do is to read the other person, read what kind of personality they are, because there is actually a link between the nonverbal cues you have biologically and the personality traits you are displaying at that moment and are prevalent. And that gives you a lot of cues. So what we learned, we actually had to sit there, we had to talk with other people with a camera in our face, and they would record us having a conversation or trying to pressure each other and stuff like that. And then we would rewatch the entire thing, you know, frame by frame by frame, sitting there with like this form that we have to fill out and we have to like tag or um, check how many times we saw this movement or that movement and then analyze the type of person that was going on, the type of interaction that was going on, who was gaining dominance in the conversation. And one of the things that, you know, that I've learned from that is that the more people are pressured, the more people are under stress, the more they retreat into their primal behavior. So within this training, they kind of described from a more philosophical standpoint, I mean, this is definitely not the scientific part of their training, but more the philosophical, the popular description was you have people who tend to be more fights. Whenever you pressure them, they will get more dominant. They will get more in your face. They will start doing more. They start thinking less. You've got people who are like flights. So the fight or flight mechanism will flee to their head into analysis. So whenever they're pressured, they will think more and they will analyze more and they will start making more plans. And you've got the freeze, the fight, flight, freeze. You probably have heard that, which is more the retreat into your emotions. You start feeling more. And sometimes you can even get stuck or overwhelmed by your feelings. And where everybody can engage in all these different styles, you know, we all have you know, something that's slightly more primary, primary than others. And the more we are pressured, the more we are retreating into that primary style. If my primary style is to be a flight and to retreat into analysis, when I will pressure you, you will retreat into analysis even more. So two lessons you can gain from this is one, if you're not really nice, you're going to pressure people to get them to do kind of like act in the way you want them to. If you want somebody to blow up or you want somebody to go silent, you kind of pressure them by making them uncomfortable. But it's also the other way around. And this has helped me a lot in working with children. A lot of behavior in children can be explained from the perspective of their stress level. And especially when you talk about twice exceptional kids or kids with challenges, that almost always there's a direct correlation that the higher the stress level is, the lower the ability to adapt, adjust, or to cope with any situation becomes. And that is actually such a profound thought um, that is so underlooked in the education system that we will say, like, this kid has bad behavior or, you know, he's got anger attacks or stuff like that. No, he's been put in an environment that's so stressful, that's so unsafe, that his stress level rises. And if your stress level rises enough, then his aggression level will go up or he will fall silent and become almost paralyzed or he'll become over, overwhelmed by his or her emotions. Like, that's not... The kid is not wrong. Like the environment is putting pressure on the kid and that's where his behavioral flexibility goes down. So two things you need to learn. One is as when you're guiding your kid, when you're a teacher, when you're an educator, provide a safe space where you know the stress level doesn't get that high. And step two, 
train somebody in managing their own stress level. I mean, this is kind of like combined with what we were talking about yesterday. You know, if you have compression time and you get overwhelmed, you need to decompress again. Well, one thing is that you, you as a parent or the educator can decompress them. But what is way more powerful is when you can get a kid to learn how to decompress themselves, how to withdraw themselves, how to do breathing exercises, how to, you know, just distract yourself or do things to lower your stress level. And usually on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, things go wrong when you hit an 8, 9 or a 10. But when you try to course correct a kid when he's at an 8, 9 or 10 and you want to tell him, yeah, you look like you're getting angry. Yeah, no, <laughs> Sherlock, that, of course that's happening. But the change is if you can notice it when you get to a 3 or a 4 and then start course correcting and doing something different to manage your own stress level. So reflect on this. How does this work for you? What happens when you get stressful? And what do you do to lower your stress? And what, you know, does your kid do when they get stressed? And what can you do to help them lower their stress? Because the better you get at that, the more autonomous good behavior you start seeing. And the more you start operating out of stress. And the worst thing that can happen is two stressed people talking to each other. Because they will stress each other more and they will show their stress response and that will trigger the other. And, we'll, you know, you'll get another stress response you know, responds back. And this keeps going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until everybody suck. So be the bigger person, reset yourself, help the other person reset, call a timeout for all I care, but do something to lower the stress level. So where could you apply this today? If you liked this episode of Raising Happy and Thriving Kids, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast software. And if you want to dive deeply into all the things you can do to help your kids thrive, be happier while making your own life more enjoyable, go to smartparentingsecrets.com where you can get free additional training. Hope you enjoyed this episode and as always, bring out the best in yourself and each other.